Our next speaker is Mark Sulkowski, who is going to present on behalf of a group from the United States, the Turquoise One data on the safety and efficacy of the 3D regime of uh, 3D regimen with ribavirin in patients with hepatitis C and HIV. Well, thank you, Dr. Peters and Dr. Klein. On behalf of my co-investigators and the entire Turquoise One study team, I'm pleased to present the results of safety and efficacy of ABT450, ritonavir, ambitazvir, dusabavir, and ribavirin in patients co-infected with hepatitis C and HIV. These are my disclosures and those of my co-investigators. By way of background, co-infection is common. Up to one-third of patients living with HIV are co-infected with hepatitis C. Among those co-infected, progression of liver disease is more rapid, leading to cirrhosis and additional complications thereof. Liver disease has emerged in the era of highly effective antiretroviral therapy as a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. Hepatitis C treatment with direct acting antivirals in combination with pegylated interferon and ribavirin has led to sustained virologic response rates. However, many co-infected patients are not eligible to be treated with interferon-containing regimens, and they have well-known treatment-limiting toxicities. As such, interferon-free regimens are highly desirable in this patient population and have shown great promise in other settings. The regimen is the three direct antiviral regimen, which, as you heard previously, includes ABT450, a NS34A protease inhibitor, boosted by the HIV-1 protease inhibitor ritonavir. It is also co-formulated with ombitazvir as a single tablet. Patients also took dosabavir, a non-nucleoside NS5B polymerase inhibitor taken twice daily, as well as ribavirin. Prior to initiation of the trial, there was extensive phase one drug-drug interaction studies conducted in healthy volunteers with tenofovir and tricytobine at azanavirotegravir that indicated no clinically meaningful changes in hepatitis C or HIV drug exposures. As you previously heard, the 3D regimen with or without ribavirin has been studied in more than 2,700 patients with high rates of sustained virologic response. More than 96% of those who are treatment naive and treatment experienced without cirrhosis for 12 weeks, and 92 to 96% in cirrhotic patients treated for 12 or 24 weeks. The Turquoise 1 study is the first part of a two part multi center phase 2 3 study to assess the safety, tolerability, and efficacy of the 3 DAA regimen in patients with HIV and hepatitis C genotype 1 co infection, including those with compensated cirrhosis. The study design of part one is shown here. The study enrolled 63 patients. They were randomized to receive the 3-DA regimen plus ribavirin for 12 weeks or the same regimen for 24 weeks. The ribavirin was administered as weight-based dosing according to the body weight of 75 kilograms at 1,000 or 1,200 in two divided doses. Today we'll be presenting the SVR12 data point for those treated for 12 weeks and the SVR4 data point for those treated for 24 weeks, all patients remain in follow-up through 48 weeks. The primary efficacy analysis is SVR4 and 12, defined as HCV RNA below the lower limit of quantification four and 12 weeks after discontinuing therapy. We're also assessing virologic response at treatment week four, known as RVR, as well as on-treatment virologic failure and post-treatment virologic relapse. In addition to the usual safety parameters, we also assessed maintenance of plasma HIV-1 RNA suppression. The key eligibility criteria are shown here. Patients aged 18 to 70 with genotype 1 infection, they could be hepatitis C treatment naive or have taken prior therapy with peginiferin or ribavirin and failed to achieve a sustained virologic response. We did allow the enrollment of patients with compensated cirrhosis. Those with decompensated liver disease were excluded. With respect to HIV-1, they had to have a RNA level of less than 40 copies per ml, a CD4 count above 200, and be on a stable regimen of either atazanavir or rotegravir inclusive antiretroviral therapy. The baseline characteristics of the enrolled patients are shown here. The majority, more than 90%, were male. About 25% were black. The mean age was nearly 51 years, and 19% had compensated cirrhosis. 
80% were IL-28B non-CC, the unfavorable uh, genotype. 87 to 91% were infected with genotype 1 subtype A. 65% had never been previously treated for hepatitis C, and 16% had a prior null virologic response to peginiferin rivaron therapy. The mean CD4 cell count was above 600, and about half were taking adizanivir and half taking raltegravir. The on-treatment virologic response was shown here. After four weeks of treatment with a 3-DA regimen plus ribavirin, all patients achieved suppression of HCVRNA below the lower limit of quantification. At the end of treatment, either treatment week 12 or 24, this was sustained in approximately 97% of patients. Looking first at the 12-week treatment group, four weeks after stopping therapy, 93.5% had a HCVRNA that remained below the lower limit of quantification, and the SVR12 response rate was 93.5%. Among those in the 24-week treatment group, the SVR4 response rate was 97%. Now, we don't have full data sets on those out to SVR12 time point. However, 20 patients have reached that time point, and no virologic relapse have been observed in those patients treated for 24 weeks and followed to the SVR12 time point. Now, I'd like to focus more closely on the three patients who did not have a virologic response observed to date. Virologic failure was seen in two patients. Both were prior and all responders to pegylated interferon and ribavirin, both infected with hepatitis C gene type 1 subtype A, both had compensated cirrhosis, and were IL-28B TT genotype. If you look at the table at the first patient, this was in the 12-week treatment group. This individual completed treatment and had a viral relapse at post-treatment week two. And you can see at the time of urologic failure, but not at baseline, there was evidence of resistant variants at NS3, NS5A, and the NS5B domains. The second patient was in the 24-week treatment group and experienced a viral breakthrough with an ACVRNA of 76 at week 16 of treatment. At the time of virologic breakthrough, resistance variants were observed in NS5A and NS5B. There was a third patient who withdrew consent. This patient withdrew consent after 10 weeks of treatment in the 12-week arm and had an undetectable HCVRNA at the time of withdrawal. No patient stopped therapy because of an adverse event. Looking a bit further at the adverse events, the majority were mild to moderate, and they included the common adverse events of fatigue, insomnia, nausea, and headache. There were no serious adverse events observed. Now, I would point out there was ocular icterus observed in six patients, the majority of whom were taking adizanivir. I'll talk about that a bit further. If we look at the laboratory evaluations, hemoglobin of less than 10 grams per deciliter was seen in seven patients overall. Six patients reduced the dose of ribavirin due to anemia. All six achieved an SVR. You can also see that there were 17 patients with an elevation in total bilirubin. This was predominantly an indirect hyperbilirubinemia. And of the 17 patients, 15 were taking adizanivir. There was one patient with AST elevation of five times upper limit normal. This patient has a, had a resolution and normalization of their serum AST level without dose interruption of either the HIV drugs or the hepatitis C therapy. Now, finally, I'd like to point out that there were five patients, uh, two in the 12-week arm and three in the 24-week arm, who had a confirmed HIV-1 RNA of greater than 40 copies per ml, but below 200 copies per ml. All five achieved a resuppression of their HIV RNA below 40 on the same HIV regimen without any interruption of therapy. So in summary, the Turquoise 1 study evaluated the interferon-free regimen of three direct acting antivirals plus ribavirin in patients with HIV infection, some of whom were treatment naive, others treatment experienced with peginiferin ribavirin. The study also included cirrhotic patients. In the 12-week treatment group, we observed an SVR 12 rate of 93.5%. In the 24-week treatment group, to date, we've seen SVR 4 in 97%. The 3D regimen was safely co-administered with either adizanivir or raltegravir containing 
antiretroviral therapy with no treatment emergent SAEs and no patient discontinued therapy due to adverse event. Overall, these results are highly consistent with those observed in genotype 1 mono-infected patients, that is, those without HIV. And finally, with respect to next steps, there is a Part 1B, which will enroll a, enroll a cohort of patients on stable darunavir-containing antiretroviral therapy, and they'll receive the three-drug regimen plus ribavirin for 12 weeks. And the Part 2 is a multicenter international study, which will plans to initiate later this year. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge with sincere gratitude the patients and their families, as well as the investigators and coordinators who made this study possible, as well as those that, on the AbV team. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. This is now open for discussion. Uh, microphone three, Dr. Rochstro. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> great presentation, Mark. I have two questions. <clears throat> the first is, uh, so you included patients who were on atazanavir, uh, and since there is a, obviously a protease inhibitor in your 3D <laughs> regimen, that would at least imply that the drug interactions are a little bit different maybe than what we've seen with other hepatitis C protease inhibitors, and obviously we've been looking for the combinability of HIV protease inhibitors with HCV therapy. So uh, can you say a little bit more, uh, considering that, you know, Symmetry is a big issue with all the PIs Tilapavir is an issue um, other than adazanavir. Bisepavir is an issue. Can you explore that a little bit? And is there already a formal PK interaction study with darunavir, considering that in your phase two you're including that? And the, shall I, my second question is, now in your study, as well as the study which Dr. Cohen presented, you still had all 1B patients treated with ribavirin. And obviously the question is, because you do have at least a significant number of anemia in both studies, uh, are the future studies going to skip the ribavirin, at least for the non-serotic genotype 1B patients? So I'll start with the, the second half of the question, which was about the 1B patients, uh, do they require ribavirin? My own opinion, after analyzing these data as well as those the monoinfected patients, are that this group of patients I would anticipate do not need ribavirin if they're infected with 1B, and that is one of the design considerations for the part two of the turquoise 1 study. Uh, the, the first part of the question is a, is a larger question, which deals with drug-drug interactions between the hepatitis C regimen and the HIV regimen, which in my mind is really the foremost question when approaching the treatment of this patient population. There was a formal healthy volunteer interaction study done with atazanavir and all three drugs in the 3DAA regimen. Now, one thing I neglected to mention was that when the patients went on to the 3D plus ribavirin, the ritonavir in the 3D regimen was used to boost the atazanavir. In other words, they did not take an additional ritonavir 100 milligram dose. So that was discontinued during the 12 weeks. The interaction study suggested no significant effects on the atazanavir levels. So this was felt to be a, uh, a safe regimen to combine. It's interesting to note that we did see hyperbilirubinemia in those patients. Uh, my own view is that was not likely due to the uh, raising the azanavir levels, but rather due to ribavirin-induced hemolysis, uh, as has been seen in other studies, such as uh, Photon-1. Um, with respect to darunavir, there have been formal uh, healthy volunteer drug-drug interaction studies conducted. and. Uh, these do uh, permit the uh, going forward with studying this. Now, the studies did show a reduction in the C trough of darunavir of roughly 40%. So the studies will go forward uh, to assess both QD and BID dosing of darunavir in combination with a three-day regimen. So those are uh, certainly important things to look at going forward. Christina? Uh, oh, thanks. I have one question, Mark. The, um, uh, did you measure adherence uh, in the two patients that uh, fail? Well, thank you for asking. Another important point I neglected to mention, the two patients uh, were adherent to their hepatitis C drug therapy by pill count, and really uh, they had achieved a undetectable viral load spec hepatitis C. We also did not see any alterations in their HIV suppression. So I don't think we can, can, can attribute those two virologic failures to non-adherence. I would point out that as we've seen in the other studies, such as turquoise 2 of serotics, this combination of null-peg ribavirin response plus cirrhosis plus 1A 
appears to be a difficult patient group to treat. Overall, there were six patients with those characteristics, uh, four of whom have achieved virologic response and the two failures. Microphone two, I'm sorry, I can't see who it is. Could you hi, state it's your Tracy name? Swan. Oh, hi, Tracy. Of the uh, five people that uh, blipped with regard to HIV viral load during treatment, what um, a, were they on um, Adesanavir, Reltegravir, or some of each? Uh, they were on, actually, it was a, almost an even split. It was three and two of Adesanavir and Reltegravir. So no obvious pattern with respect to these blips of HIV-1 RNA during therapy. Microphone three, Dr. Bagnani. Hi, Mark. Thank you very much. So, Mark, I was, I was going to ask, looking at the fantastic results that we've seen in part one of the study, do you think part two of the study should exclude the 24-week arm? Uh, another great question. Uh, and certainly, when one looks at the uh, data from the entire uh, phase three development program of the three direct active antivirals plus ribavirin, the only group that seemed to need the longer course of therapy that is 24 weeks were PEG ribavirin null responders with cirrhosis and genotype 1A. So it, I think it is uh, appropriate to adopt that same 12 weeks for everyone else, but for the patients with this uh, constellation of difficult to treat characteristics, perhaps 24 weeks would be beneficial. So those are in discussion for part two. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.